we began our devotional, we were chanting, God is all there is. And love is all there is. And so it feels like the perfect segue, if you will, the perfect continuity for me to ask you to begin to think in this moment about what that means. Now that means you too, even if you have in brunch or whatever you're doing, to pause long enough to bring to mind your life and how you are currently expressing the divine. God is all there is. Love is all there is. What I know for sure is that any time we say I am, we are affirming our sense of being. This is where the church is supposed to say amen. <laughs> Wherever the church is located, regardless of country, region, household, street, avenue, lane, this would be a moment. Destiny, I am so grateful when we are in co-ministry because you do the heavy lifting. <laughs> Thank you so very, very much. I am many, I am, yes, I am. How about that? Just a point of awareness. I am. What I feel right now is I am grateful. I'm willing. I am willing being here in the pulpit with my new little setup and all the things and, and just determined to not be distracted and still be open and available to the divine no matter what. I am willing. Some years ago, when I first began kind of preaching on the regular, and uh, many of y'all didn't even know me then. Y'all think you know when that was, but because I'm trying to maintain a little story about youth, I'm not going to expose all of it. But here's the thing. Folks used to, some, some of the elders, if you will, or they seem so at the time, <laughs> would say that I was a serial preacher. And I have come to, to realize that that, that that is true for me that there really is something about setting a tone, setting an intention, and then kind of rocking and rolling with that. So y'all know we've been, I have been doing my best to get through the seven senses so that we, we have a sense. I'm, I'm tagging back to Luke 10, which is where we first began the Sunday after Easter, because we were looking at, that was just the beginning of that 40-day period between the resurrection and the ascension as, as it's recorded. And there's some teaching that is happening. I'm going to invoke Dr. Will and say that the women didn't need to be taught, though. The women had what appeared to be an innate knowing of how to be and what to do. The brothers had to be called in. So they were the disciples, which really translates to students. But now we're seeing them as apostles, which really, for our purposes, means they're to go out and take the word. But before you can go out and take the word, somebody, your teachers go say, you know what, I need to talk to you. Because I need you to know something. I need you to take this word in a certain way. So the way that I interpret it, the way, what it means to me, is it was that special kind of coaching where you, you, it's a, it's, you're in an, you've completed your internship, as it were, but now you're about to start doing the thing, but it's just like, come, I need you to, I need you to more fully understand how this is because you're moving from let's say, the classroom environment and, a, and some role-playing. <laughs> How about that? We're moving from the role-play and, and a few little structured situations and circumstances to now you getting ready to be out there and be the one to do the thing. Yes? Does this make sense? So look here. And if you're at home and it's not making, put something in the chat. They'll let me know. And I, we'll clean it up when we get to it because we're going to be here for a little while. So look at here. So in Luke... 
He is really the, the master teacher, Yeshua, that the world ultimately came to call Jesus, is, is laying it out. And I'll remind you that he tells them right up front, you, I'm sending you out like lambs to wolves. Translation, this ain't going to be easy. <laughs> it's, it's, you've had me, you know, we've been cooking, we've been, we've been cutting it up. But now it's going to be where you must know who you be. Who are you? What do you know? What's to happen in that? You're to go your way and do it in a different way. Be open. And this is an adventure in faith. The disciples, I'm sure, told him. In addition to, Master, this is a hard teaching. This is an adventure in faith. You are, you are removing all of the, the safety net. All that, the, all that the Old Testament gave. Oh, now, I'm saying Old Testament. There was not a New Testament yet, so do not, don't put that in the chat. So, but, but the old teaching, that would be it. What, what you're doing is removing the foundation of all the old teaching. The law about what we can do and where we can go and with whom we can be and under what circumstances. You're removing all of that. And telling us to be with everybody all the time, no matter what. To my mind, the master teacher is saying, you're going to have to develop all your senses. Because you're going to have to know beyond knowing. There's not going to be anybody there to say, this one, not that one. You're going to have to have a level of knowing. You're going to have to see beyond your ocular system. You're going to have to hear beyond your auditory system. This, you're going to have to develop all of your senses. Remind them, please, with, the, with our little mind map. Now, we haven't, I'm not even going to apologize because y'all signed up for me. This, 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 I'm doing the best I can. If I could have gotten through all these, in the, I would have done it. But it turns out not so. So what we are going to do, the first week we talked about sight, and then last week we went to hearing, and we're going to do sight and hearing together today. <laughs> Cause, because it's deep. What, we need to get this part before we start skipping through some, at least I do. I do. Let me not speak for y'all. Y'all probably got it and want me to move on, but I don't, I need another, I need to go just a little another further here. So, First of all, I want to remind you that as we talk about sight, I want to bring your attention to vision because I'm, I'm wanting us to get to beyond just the nuance of it. I want to be really clear that we're not talking about our ocular system. We're not talking about whether you wear lenses or don't and whether you had the LASIK or whether you got the whatever it is so that you are free from wearing optical corrected, co correction. We're not talking about that. We're talking about vision. And vision is defined as the faculty or state of being able to see. Now, my sense is that many, if not all of us, know somebody who sees, I grew up with people calling it beyond the veil. The people who saw something that nobody else saw. Well, that's not true. The people who saw something and said they saw it, while nobody else was willing to say they saw it or see it. Because what I'm talking about here is that, are y'all hearing me for real though? You, you understand the distinction I was trying to make there. The ones that we said could see beyond the veil were the ones who stood up and said, I see it. And the people who also saw it thought, I ain't going to tell them I see it though. I'm going to see what happens to that one. Because, you know, we haven't always been kind to people who knew more than we knew, who felt more than we felt. we still not kind to people who feel more than we feel. So there have been those who felt it wasn't safe to do it. But I want you to be clear what we're talking about. Vision is the ability to think about or plan the future. What? With imagination? or wisdom, a knowing beyond knowing, 
a knowing beyond what you're taught. I think that this is what the master teacher was saying to the apostles. I'm taught you, you got all that. And sometimes when you, when you graduate, you don't know all you need to know, but you got all they going to give you. You know, they like, not, and you feel like, have, at least I have, not, let me not speak to all graduates everywhere and those who are about to graduate because it is graduation season, that I have often, I have on occasion felt like, no, I mean, you want it to be over and you're working towards the completion of it. And when it is, you're like, no, I need another class. Or I need to go back over this because you, you, you want to do the work and get it done, but you're not ready to do life from that. But with vision, it's, it's the future. It's looking at what is through your imagination and your wisdom. And it's an interesting concoction because this is not where you're making it up. This is where you are receiving it. This is where you are open to it. Likewise, listening. Listening is not the same as hearing. Hearing is, hearing is right now, if you listen, oh, watch this. Right now, there is a sound of the air filter system. But some of you won't hear it unless you listen. Some heard it right away because their ears are tuned in and functioning, highly functioning, so you hear it. We'll hear a truck go by, but it won't phase you because you're what? Not listening to it. Now, if you're listening, for like my brother has a truck that when he pulls up to my house, I know he's there. But I don't pay any attention unless I'm listening for him. I'm expecting him, so I'm listening to hear that truck. So both of these, this vision requires that we tune in and this listening. Hearing does not require tuning in. Hearing just says your auditory system is working at the moment. Listening says your spiritual entunement is assigned to something. You're paying attention with thoughtful attention. You're giving consideration to it. Come on now. You are alert to catch something, yes? Some sound, some word, some note, yeah? So this is what we're, 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 I am reminding you that we must develop all seven senses. But I want to rock for just a moment, for a while longer, with this notion of vision and listening. In A Course in Miracles, in um, the workbook lesson 20, I'm adapting it for our purposes. It says, I am determined to see. And it doesn't mean, so I'm going to the optometrist tomorrow (laughs) to get a new prescription. It means instead, I'm determined to change my present perspective. I'm seeing some stuff, and I am perceiving and interpreting what I see, and I'm determined to have a different perspective about it. Does that make sense? So in the course, it does not say I am determined to hear, but it means it on my planet. Can you see how I'm now seeing something that isn't necessarily there? And I'm hearing something that can't necessarily be heard by anyone who isn't tuned in in the same way. I am determined to hear, meaning listening would be the same idea. That I am determined to change my present state of what I am, what I'm, what's cueing me. Okay, some of y'all acting like you need an example. I know you don't, but I'll say it if you force me to. That you're present with someone, and now you all of a sudden, to the other person, have an attitude. And they're like, what? Did you hear how she spoke to me? They're like, well, she said, when did you get here? When did you arrive? Well, yeah, well, that's what I mean. Now, you see, the words, the, the fact 
is clear and agreed upon. What isn't is what it meant. That's the listening. That's the listening. Sometimes in our woundedness, our listening discerns, perceives something that wasn't intended. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes it was intended. Your work is to discern, though. And then if you're really in practice to decide whether that means anything other than your awareness. See, it doesn't mean you need to take your earrings off. Some of y'all understand what I'm talking about. It could simply mean you have an awareness of what the intention was or the way, more importantly, how it landed with you. It's important for you to have, for all of us to have, it's part of our I amness, I think, for us to have a clear sense of what does that mean for me? What am I going to do with that? I don't like it, but what am I going to do? Am I willing to undo my spiritual practice? To have a moment or a year of righteousness? What am I going to do with that awareness? Oh, yeah, if I'm going to get me, I'm going to put some on you too. So look, this idea here is that we are willing that this speaking this i am determined to see i am determined to to listen to hear i am determined to vision i am determined to listen is our way of putting ourselves and the universe on notice of our intention to claim our true heart's desire our authentic heart's desire because none of us really wants to be stuck. And so what, what I am declaring on my behalf for anybody who's willing to get in here is that we are declaring our freedom. Our desire to be free, our salvation. Of course, the miracles would say that salvation is the freedom of love and forgiveness. So I know we not always, some, for some, you know, forgiveness is still a bad word. We're not really trying to hear that, but I already said it, so I'm going to let it hang out here. And see if it can't permeate a sense of shift to inspire us to up-level our belief and align our perception in truth and love. You see... I experience it is done unto me, unto each and every one of us, as we believe, as that very idea of cause and effect. As I am yet believing, I am setting a cause in motion. It is done unto me the effect. I will experience an effect out of my belief. I'm aligning my energy, if you will, my all in all, my I amness. I'm aligning it with what I believe, not what I say. I know if only it could just be what we tell people we believe. God, God, wouldn't that be better for all? Oh, let me just say, Lord, if I could just, all I had to do was just say, well, I believe that everybody, and then, you know, ellipses. And then my life would just be transformed into the cause and effectual experience of me having said, I believe that. Heck no. It's going to require that I live and align my living with that belief before I see any traction. She said probably a little too passionately. Somebody's like, Rev TMI, you, you, that's a little too specific. You're you telling too many things. So I'm going to move on to 1 Corinthians 2 and 9, <laughs> where it says, but it is written, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, 
and upon the heart of humanity has not come up that which the divine, the living one, the strong one has prepared for those who love him. Which means who believe and who behave as if they believe. Now, that would be a whole sermon for such a time as this. Because we live in a time where it's okay to just wave the flag of whatever it is. You don't have to do the flag of Christianity. You don't have to have a Christ-like thought, let alone deed, but just be all about it. Yes. And that's now, don't, don't get carried away like looking out there because, you know, it's vision, which is an inside job. I, we need to see ourselves. This is a Michael Jackson person in the mirror moment. Where do we see? What are we waving? Like the absolute, this is who I am, how I, this is, and just the evidence is not consistent. It's a huge opportunity for us. A huge opportunity. But look, I had, to, I had to catch myself here because it starts by saying it is written. Which means that when Paul is speaking it now, he's tagging back to something. Yes? So I know that he's tagging back to Isaiah 64 and 4, and I'm going to get there in a minute, but Paul here is referring to things of the Spirit, truths that cannot be seen cannot be heard, cannot be understood by the human mind alone. You're not smart enough. You're not going to be smart enough. This is going to be a moment that requires our alignment with the divine, our surrender. Can you see this? And I'm, I'm, it just occurred to me that in, in kind of in graduation period in the season of graduations, we sometimes have a sense, well, now let me again just speak for me that you, you know, I can be all that because I just, I just did the dang thing for show. Sure. And you're right, Andriette, you did do that. That's why we're here. We know that that was done and we're celebrating it, but you, there's an opportunity for me to note the moments. Y'all remember the, the poster footprints? You know the story. And it's, it's that idea where, you know, where were you living one, strong one, while I was going through all I was going through, that whole adventure in faith. Look at how it showed out. There's only one set of footprints. Y'all know the story. And then the realization comes that those aren't my footprints. Those are the footprints of the one that carried me, the one that got me over, the one that brought me through. This is that moment of realization that it's not just what we see, it's what we are required to know and know that we know that we know that we know that we know. We must first open ourselves to divine guidance in order to receive it. It's where we open ourselves, yes? So I'd be remiss if I didn't take you to Isaiah 64 and 4, which is the point of origin. And so often in the New Testament, they are drawing from, because they would. That's what they were taught and studied. Was And of course, it wasn't the Old Testament then. It was simply the books. It was the teaching. It was the teaching of the elders. It was the word that they had. And now there's an update to the word. But I want to just tag back. In Isaiah 64 and 4, it says, For since the beginning of the world, people have not heard nor perceived by the ear. Neither has the eye seen, O oh God, beside thee what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. For the one who's tapped in. Can you hear that? This notion of for the one who waits. For, because see, that one would have to know. You don't just wait. Your waiting is based on something. 
I'm waiting on the bus to come. I'm waiting for them to give me my money back. I'm waiting up. You, you. For the one who waits, there's a, an expectancy that is implied here, isn't it? Come on now. I'm not even, go- but look, 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 look. In this, because it requires, it clearly, at least in my mind, I like kind of breaking things down sometimes. And what I see here in the breakdown is that this requires a recognition. You're going to wait. There's, there's some recognition. And then there must be some realization as well. Now, for those who understand what affirmative prayer is and how, it, how it's laid out, how it's set up, you recognize that as the first two steps. And you know there's no point in going nowhere until you've done the first two steps of recognizing first the divine, what we're working with. Recognizing the all in all and then realizing something about that. Now, none of that has anything to do with the ocular system or the auditory. This is another level of realization. This is why these two steps are so important. Some folks would say, if you got those two steps, you, you don't even have to worry about the rest. Just let your, just loose your vocal cords. Because once that's established, what gets said after that is just the divine intention of the ancestors, of the angels, of the all and all once grounded in the recognition, which is what I know that I know that I know. And then I'm realizing what that means. What it means to recognize that. There are five steps, but if you get those two, you can coast. Because what is established in that is what the what a course in miracles calls the holy instant. That that moment in time, the perfect shift in perception, and 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 that's how I work. But the, my treatment, because sometimes in the beginning, I don't know that I know. I mean, I know because I'm trained to know. And I know because I've practiced for decades, but that don't mean that in that moment that I need prayer that I know. But when I start in recognition of the truth as I have understood it so far, for real, and starting with a, with a reach for it as far as I can go, as high as I can go, as deep as I can go, And then I realize what that means to me. That right there is a holy instant. Because the holy instant is that moment when there is a shift in perception. So yes, the surgery is scheduled and whatever. And the, the prognosis and the diagnosis and the relationship and the money and all of the things that wear us out. Right? All of the stuff that, you know, brings us to our knees often. Or sometimes we just stretched out in the horror of it and the fear and the shame and the guilt and the grief. All of those emotions. But there is a moment in recognition and realization when all of that falls into its proper place. It's like one of those domino designs that is set up that all you got to do is touch that first one. God, I wish I had one right here. Y'all saw it. (laughs) Y'all heard it. (laughs) And there was nothing there to see nor hear. (laughs) In a sense. There was a little something, something. Look. The idea here 
the calling. A Course in Miracles would say, don't even try to solve a problem. Don't even try. It's not you. You out your league. And then I would remind you because you have to move from where you are. This is what treatment does with recognition and realization. The way it's built is to ensure that you are not trying to address the problem from what? The level of the problem. Because you're already in trouble. How you going to solve the trouble from the trouble? Those two steps, though, support us in moving from an energetic, a consciousness of the trouble, the problem, the grief, the fear, the doubt, the shame, the guilt, to establish ourselves in a higher knowing, a higher calling, a higher awareness, also called truth. You got some facts, and the facts are wearing you out. This is why every Sunday and during the week on the website and Wednesday recap, all the things we send out, we say, get you some prayer. Because we know what we're working with. We know we're on an adventure in faith, and you going to stub your toe minimally. And you can't solve the, t- the stub toe from the stub toe. You cannot just tell us how awful it is. And if I took my shoe off, you would see how it's throbbing. All of that does what? It increases the pain. It increases the focus and the energetic presence of the, quote, problem. The situation, as it were. But the shift in energy, the shift in awareness, the shift in focus, the shift in recognition, the shift in the realization from the throbbing toe to the divine order in the universe that is present in and throughout my entire body. And there's no way to say my entire body and exclude the toe. So we realize that something else is happening simultaneously at the same time. This is where when we practice aright, we are assured of receiving the answer that is designed for each of us. Yes? So look. It's all about divine guidance, which is sometimes we speak of divine guidance like some folks got it, some folks don't. Some folks tuned in, some folks ain't. Some folks paying attention, some folks not. But divine guidance simply is. I hope that's clear. Divine guidance is always, everywhere, always. First time it was A-L-W-A-Y-S. This time it's A-L-L-W-A-Y-S. Always, in always, present. Divine guidance is. The question is, are you going to get some? I needed to say it in a way you'd remember. There are those, I think we can all understand this. So I'm just going to give kind of this one setup for it. That, well, I don't know if we all understand it. I understand it all too well. That's what I really mean when I say we all understand it. <laughs> I mean, I, didn't take, I got the lesson. I probably got your lesson too because I've had so many lessons in this. And the idea here is that it is most discernible, the presence of divine guidance and its availability and responsiveness is most easily discerned when we are flat on our back. Are we bent over in fetal position somewhere 
in the emergency room at the end of, at the end of our proverbial rope. That's when we see it. Because otherwise, when you're just standing at the curb, kind of some do, some of don't, you can hardly tell the difference between you and the divine. You know what I mean? You just, oh, I got the insight that I should call you, that you should come pick me up, whatever it is. You just, it's you and the divine, and you can hardly tell who said what. But oh, when you are at the end of the road, when you know you've done all you could do, you've called on everybody you know to call on, you are left. To where, the, where an elder would say where you should have started. Now you didn't run out of other options. You didn't finally decided, you know what? <laughs> it can't hurt. Can't hurt no more than I'm already hurting, so I may as well just do this here, right? But it's in that moment that you really know what worked because you know that's all you did. <laughs> Unless you're really silly, in which case you decide that it wasn't that, but it was what you did the year before. No offense, you just not. I don't know. The idea here is that when we are in a crisis, it's probably in that moment where we promise. If I get through this, if I live, if I, if the, if only, if he, if she, I'll just, I promise, I swear. Can you feel the energy that's in that? I don't have to tell you because there's not a one of us who hadn't been there. Not a one of us. And we know that we have put, how's it got all our eggs in that one basket? I've probably been giving you all enough metaphors for today, though. <laughs> we know that we really cannot escape our awareness of our connection with the divine. And the answer the answer is always going to be an answer of peace. It's going to be an answer that expands your consciousness. It's not going to confirm your limited view. Please don't ask me how I know. Please don't. It's all too painful. <laughs> what we know for sure is that this interaction is not passive at all. This is like, it's, it's well, also in Isaiah 65 and 24, and I will answer before they call. Because your energy is the ask. You, see, that's not just like a promise out of, say, before you form the words, because the words are not the thing. The feeling, what you knew as you dropped to your knees, and it's not that the knees are essential, a part of it, but often it is a drop to the knees. You just, and what is that but a surrendered position? That's just like, Lord, I just give up. Just, and in that moment, it's this idea I'll answer before you call. Because before you said that, you were already in the give up, in the let go, in the release of it. See, what's happening here, though, is, is I don't want you to miss because I'm a pretty good storyteller. I wouldn't want you to miss the point, which is... That the divine is always, in the words of Donnie McClurkin, speaking to your heart. Speak to my heart, Holy Spirit. If I can hear from you, I'll know what to do. Just let your spirit guide and let your word abide. Speak to my heart, Lord. So look. Many, many moons ago, 
Oh, Lord, I'm thinking that's long enough to have raised a child that'd be taller than both of us at this point, Destiny. Many, many moons ago in another lifetime, it seems, I preached a sermon from 1 Samuel. And, um, and after that, my sister Destiny wrote a song about it. And I just, I want to set it up for you because what touched me is exactly what's coming through in this message. That in 1 Samuel, we have the story of, of Hannah who is barren and she's, pl- meaning she's without child. She's without child, and she is praying to God for a child, and she's promising like we do. She's promising. She's at that point that we're just talking about. She's saying, if, if, I, if, this, if this prayer can just be granted, I will dedicate. If you give me a son, I'll dedicate that son to your work. I'll, see, it's going to be a win-win, God. If you give me the son, I'm going to give him back. I'm gonna, see, I'm working it out. In, in my surrender for my heart's desire authentically. Is this making sense? So we can feel Hannah because Hannah's us. We know Hannah. <clears throat> we know Hannah in that way. So while Hannah is, is at the altar praying, she's just, she's praying to herself, but her lips are moving. She's, you know, she's, she's working it out. And so the priest... Eli sees her, and he thinks she's drunk because, you know, this behavior is not becoming. And so he speaks to her, and then she, she's, no, 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 that's not, I'm, I'm praying, and here's the story. And she, he says, oh, okay, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have requested. Recognizing a divine power that does make a way out of no way. I'm just saying. Okay, so she goes on off and then she gets pregnant. Names her child Samuel. Or the child is named Samuel. You know, we don't know where she got this. I'm just saying. So look, once she had weaned him, she takes him to Eli the priest for him to be trained just like she promised. She's keeping her promise. And while Eli, so Eli trains him, and then one night. Now, should I stop here and let you tell it? Okay. All right. All right. All right. So, So he has studied with Eli. Come on, disciples. Come on, apostles. You've been studying And now this is kind of, okay, I got one more. This is where the rubber meets the road. So look, Samuel hears a voice call him. So he knows it's Eli. It has to be. Ain't nobody there. But I mean, who else would be calling him but Eli? So he gets up and he goes to Eli. And he said, you you called me. And Eli like, no, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. He goes back to bed. Settles in. He hears the calling again. He's like, oh, it has to be Eli. He goes back to his teacher and says, you called. Yes, you called. I'm answering. He said, no. But Eli, if he's a teacher, he knows something. So in due time, Eli said, oh, he realized that Samuel was hearing a call. And so he taught him what to do because he's the teacher. He taught him how to respond. He said, go on back. Rest. Be receptive. Be open and available. But he also told him, tell me what you... Because Eli knew the message was coming. In fact, Eli knew what needed to happen. Because just like us, God had already told him how it was going to be. But he was hoping it wasn't going to be like that. So Samuel has to tell Eli what Eli already knew was going to happen. 
I ask you to now just join me in prayer. Destiny, you and I will do this. Today's message, I touched myself in an awareness that I am being called, always. Sometimes it feels like the ancestors, sometimes it feels like the angels, sometimes it's feeling like the divine, sometimes it's just feeling like. But what I know that I know that I know, I know that there's a calling on my life. I know that there's a purpose for my being. And that this is true for each and every one of us. I know that there is one life. And that that life is the living one, the strong one. That that life is whole, it's perfect, it's complete. That I am living that life and that that life is living me. The life of the living one, the strong one, is living me right now. And I am living the life of the living one, the strong one. It is calling me and everyone by name, calling us into the fullness of our being. And so right now I realize in this oneness that I am inseparable from the living one, the strong one, and the living one, the strong one is inseparable from me. All of the lies I've told over time and across time about being alone or feeling abandoned or not being supported, I know now is not true because I have always been held in the love of the divine, the living one, the strong one, right where I am always and always. It's impossible for it to be otherwise. And what I know is that what is true for me is simply true. It's true, and that's why it's true for me. It's true for all of us, that none of us is alone. That the divine, the living one, the strong one surrounds and enfolds and imbues each and every one of us, top to bottom, side to side, in and throughout. We are covered. We are held. We are lifted up. So knowing this, I know that whatever is on, whatever prayer is on the tip of a tongue or choked back on a throat or now meandering through a mind, I know that it's already answered. I know that it's no secret. The fact that you haven't said it out loud, the fact that it hasn't been revealed is not a secret to the divine. Before you, before they call, I will answer. Oh, I'm just giving thanks. I'm giving thanks for hearing my name. I'm giving thanks for hearing the call, for knowing that something more is required. I'm giving thanks for standing in, living in the energetic presence of the divine. Showing up as humanity. Showing up as everybody, everywhere. Always. Oh, I give thanks right now for those who have kindly pulled me along, encouraged me in ways. I'm grateful right now for those who knocked me down, for those who wore me out. I'm grateful for the divine interaction that no matter how it looked to me or how it felt to me or how I judged it, that I can know something more in this moment that all of this was simply calling me by name, getting my attention, bringing me back to focus on the all and all. Oh, it is an absolute perfect gratitude for this awareness, for this truth that is present for each and every one of us, that we are all being called by name, by life. I just give thanks. In perfect gratitude, I release this word. I turbocharge it, releasing it into the perfect activity of law. I just let it go. I release it. I know and I know that I know that it's done. (laughs) 
Before they call, I will answer. It is done. And for this, I am grateful. So I simply let it be. I seal it for all eternity by simply saying, Ashe, Amen. And so it is. Love math.